Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eileen McFarland. I wanted to start by thank you all for sticking with us until the end of the conference. Um, I know that your brains are probably super saturated with information. And before we send you off to see Imogene Heap, I just wanted to leave you with some few more things to think about. Um, I'm currently working on an open source project that's meant to promote police oversight. And I'm interested in talking about the ways that facial recognition can make this work more efficient. I won't be doing a Q&A. However, if you're interested in talking, um, you can catch me afterward or get at me on Slack. Um, my Twitter handle is also code that code, and I've put it on every slide. I think it's being cut off, so it kind of looks like code that cod. I promise it's not a fish joke. Let's get started. Facial recognition is terrifying. Numerous studies have demonstrated that facial recognition is racially biased. This is a photo of Joy Bull and Winnie. When Joy Bolamwini was an undergraduate student, she was using face auto detection software with a few classmates, who were mostly white, and she noticed that the software could easily pick up the, face, the faces of her white classmates. However, it couldn't detect her own face until she put on a white mask. She went on to found the Algorithmic Justice League and is now a researcher at MIT Media Lab. She did research that showed facial recognition um, for darker-skinned women of color has error rates as high as 35%. Meanwhile, the same software has an error rate of only 1% for white men. The racial bias, as well as the gender bias, in facial recognition runs the risk of not only upholding, but also intensifying existing systems of oppression. This is a photo from a recent community hearing on the Detroit Police Department's Greenlight Initiative. The Greenlight Initiative purports to identify suspects in violent crime using facial recognition software. There's been strong community opposition to this because facial recognition has been shown to be less effective in identifying black people. According to the US 2010 census, Detroit is 81.6% black. As a result, it's possible that the facial recognition software could misidentify many individuals and worsen racism in the criminal justice system. Additionally, there is an extreme lack of regulation, not only around facial recognition, but also around how law enforcement uses this software. The New York Times recently reported that beginning in 2011, the NYPD began using a facial recognition database. In 2015, they began adding juveniles' photos to this database, and it now includes photos of children as young as 11. This despite the fact that children do have certain protections in terms of privacy. And additionally, facial recognition has been shown to be less effective in identifying individuals who are younger because typically it's trained with adults' photos. I provided examples of how the state using facial recognition can cause harm to vulnerable and marginalized communities. But what happens when the cameras get turned around? What happens when we watch The Watcher? For the last few months, I've been working on a project called Open Oversight, which promotes police accountability through open data. Today, I'll talk about how I'm incorporating both machine learning and facial recognition into the project to snoop onto them as they snoop onto us. Here's a quick outline of the contents of the talk. I'll explain what open oversight is, both how it works and why it's necessary. Then I'll run through our data sources and how we sort the data. Next, we're going to talk about ethical and legal concerns, of which there are many. And then I'll touch on the technical implementation and the three main points, starting with AWS recognition and then moving on to face API.js, an open source tool which I use for both auto detecting faces and facial recognition. There's going to be a surprise, so don't leave early. And at the end, I'm going to get philosophical in our closing. Yeah. As I mentioned, Open Oversight is a web app with the goal of making it easier to report police misconduct. It started in Chicago, where I lived for many happy years, and it's now also active in Berkeley, Oakland, and New York City, though we do have limited data for New York City. You can see the actual website um, at the link on the slide, openoversight.com. Additionally, a group called Open Justice Baltimore forked the source code to create a Baltimore-specific site, bpdwatch.com. 
Again, there is a link on the slide in case you'd like to see the website. I will walk through the general user flow of Open Oversight um, before showing a brief demo. In order to do a police misconduct report in Chicago, you need the police officer's name and badge number. Individuals who are affected by police misconduct often do not have access to this information. Open Oversight functions like a directory where you can search for officers based on what you remember of the name and badge number or demographic data, then identify them and be taken to an external website to do a complaint. This is the Open Oversight landing page. You can navigate to identify officers, um, select the department, in this case Chicago, then enter what you may remember of their name, uh, we have visuals of what the different rank looks like in terms of insignia and badge type. Next, select anything you remember about their identity, such as gender. And finally, you can identify them and be taken to an external website to do a complaint. So this is one of my favorite slides. Um, I am a very proud member of Lucy Parsons Labs. Lucy Parsons Labs is a Chicago-based collaboration between data scientists and transparency activists. Um, and we focus on data liberation uh, as well as civic transparency, such as transparency around police data. And additionally, we do a lot of FOIA lawsuits. Um, I'll explain FOIA since it's a bit of a jargony term. It stands for the Freedom of Information Act, and it states that Government agencies must give individuals access to public records. Uh, this could uh, include anything from police rosters to also emails or phone call records. I focus my work on open oversight. Let's talk about why open oversight is a necessary tool. From March 2011 to March 2015, 28% of police misconduct complaints in Chicago were immediately dropped without any action because they lacked identification information. That's 4,000 complaints in total that were not investigated, period. This is a statistic from the Citizen Police Data Project from the Invisible Institute. Um, the Invisible Institute is an organization that works to help community members hold public institutions accountable. So even though I don't have Q&A, there is audience participation. I want people to try and guess from approximately the same time period, March 2011 to, to September 2015, what percent of police misconduct complaints resulted in discipline for an officer? Just guess. Okay, so some of you definitely knew the stat before. It's 2%. Boo! Yeah, so fewer than 2% of the 28,567 police misconduct complaints filed led to any sort of discipline, and additionally, the majority officers who did face discipline were suspended for a week or less. This is clearly a problem. As promised, I'll discuss where we've got data for the project, both in terms of the rosters and actual images. Um, as I said, we do FOIA requests. That's a request for uh, public records. If you're interested in doing one of these, uh, you can look at the link, lucyparsonslabs.com slash FOIA presentation, and we have lots of resources that will help you get started. I also wanted to highlight a recent FOIA ruling, which is relevant both to our work and also to anyone who has strong feelings about Taylor Swift. So, <laughs> I know she's contentious. I'm honestly not a big fan, but I thought this was a really great story, so I decided to include it. Rob Warden, um, who is the co-director of a journalist organization called Injustice Watch, recently did a FOIA for the photos of eight Chicago police officers. The police department refused to comply with it, um, and they argued that they had a policy of exempting officers' photos from FOIAs because, as they said, citing Taylor Swift in court, she runs facial recognition on people at her concerts in order to identify stalkers, um, and they were afraid that someone might do something similar to photos of officers. I really want to know who the Swifty is in the Chicago Police Department's legal team. <laughs> Just saying, I don't think you can FOIA for it. I would love to know. Um, the judge responded, you need to calm down. 
And then the judge ruled against the CPD policy of exempting officers from FOIA requests. In addition to doing FOIA requests, um, we've also in the past scraped social media, particularly Flickr, to get officers' photos. This is a really great tactic if you're interested in getting photos of police officers. I particularly recommend checking out their Twitter accounts, um, particularly the department-specific account. We're going to return to this in later demos. And in addition to those methods of obtaining photos, um, we also allow users to submit photos directly to the website. I want to stress how much we prioritize user privacy. We don't log any information about people who submit photos. In addition, if you have a particularly high security submission, you can use our secure drop instance. I think it's ex important to explain why we don't log information. There is a history of people who document police misconduct then being retaliated against by police officers. This can cause people to be afraid to submit photos or to speak out. Um, in order to build trust with our users, we don't log anything. After photos are submitted, they get sorted by volunteers. Um, so the sorting process has two steps. Uh, this is a photo of the first step where we ask a volunteer to check yes or no whether or not a photo actually contains police officers. Volunteers are required to create accounts, and additionally, we do log who sorted which photo. Um, if a volunteer repeatedly misidentifies or miscategorizes a photo, they would then lose the ability to volunteer. After a photo has been categorized as containing officers, it would move to the next step, um, in which we ask a volunteer to identify the specific police officer. They can do this by searching through the rosters. Um, we also ask that they draw a square around the police officer's face. On the front end, we use the JavaScript library CropperJS for this. So there are a lot of things about facial recognition that can get complicated, not only facial recognition, but also machine learning, um, from both an ethical standpoint and a legal standpoint. I want to discuss these concerns before I talk about the actual technical approach we took. I'll start by saying that the, uses, the US's law enforcement system is deeply racist. Police misconduct and brutality hurt people of color the most. As a result, I believe that making it easier to report police misconduct can help to push back on this deeply embedded form of systemic racism. But as I also discussed at the beginning of this talk, facial recognition has been shown to be racially biased. Is it OK to use a racially biased technology to help fight a deeply racist system. I struggled a lot with this question. Um, it's something that I'm still working through as I continue to work on the project, and I think it's important for me to explicitly state that my perspective as A, a white person who has never experienced police brutality, and B, someone who because of my race is less likely to get misidentified by facial recognition does affect my perspective. So I worked through this concern um, in two ways, both technically and conceptually. So from a technical standpoint, um, I added safeguards so that a volunteer will still have to manually approve each result from facial recognition. Uh, if you were at the morning keynote, this is what Professor Broussard would refer to as a human in the loop system. That means that no facial recognition result is put into our data without first having a human double check. And then from a conceptual standpoint, I think we need to remember that bias is most harmful when it's coupled with institutional power. Let's walk through some hypothetical scenarios to demonstrate this. Suppose that someone is misidentified as a crime suspect by police's use of facial recognition technology. If they're not able to pay bail, they may then be incarcerated before trial. If they're incarcerated because they can't pay bail, they might then lose their job. And if they lose their job and they're low income and they don't have savings, they might then get evicted. This could have extreme consequences for their life. And I'm also just going to put in a little plug. This is also why it's good to consider donating to community bond funds. Now, let's look at a different scenario. Thank you for the claps. <laughs> Let's look at a different scenario. Suppose that someone who's affected by police misconduct files a report and they accidentally file it about the wrong officer. As shown by the 2% stat from earlier in the talk, 
it's highly unlikely that this will have disastrous consequences for the police officer. They have both legal departments and powerful police unions to protect them. The balance of power, it's not balanced, it's a bit like this. Additionally, for those who might be considering similar questions about how to ethically use both facial recognition and machine learning, I recommend reading a paper called A Mulching Proposal. Um, I included a link at the bottom. And so the subtitle of the paper is really telling. It's analyzing and improving an algorithmic system for turning the elderly into high nutrient slurry. <laughs> yeah, they don't hide it. Um, so in this hypothetical scenario, the researchers discuss a group that has decided to respond to global nutritional deficits by mulching elderly people into nutritional slurry. And this is a graphic of the process on the slide. So they walk through the different issues of how to make an algorithm that accurately screens people by age. And then they note, it's not enough to have an accurate algorithm if what it's doing, turning people into soylent green, is ultimately unethical. Here's a direct quote. Sometimes the problem is not how the sausage gets made, but that they're making people into sausage. <laughs> as technologists, or as technologists who, who aspire to be involved in civic tech, I think we need to consider not only is the tech working, but what is it working for? Legal concerns. Um, so as some of you may have heard, facial recognition has been banned in certain jurisdictions. For example, the city of Somerville, Massachusetts recently banned facial recognition. <coughs> Additionally, San Francisco has banned all agencies, including police, um, from using facial recognition. Since this project started in Chicago, um, I'm going to provide particular attention to Illinois-specific law. Illinois has a state law called the Biometric Information Privacy Act, BIPA for short. So the Biometric Information Privacy Act states that a person's biometric data cannot be stored without their explicit consent. If you violate BIPA, the affected individual can receive a fine of $1,000 or greater if the amount equal to the damage caused is greater than $1,000. Um, so that's a lot of money. And I'm doing this for a nonprofit, so we're obviously prioritizing not getting sued. And since a facial recognition scam would include someone's facial recognition markers, that would actually violate BIPA, which is part of why we haven't used it before in the project. I do want to note that there are various machine learning processes that would not run afoul of BIPA. For example, auto detection of faces, when you just draw squares around every face, um, that's completely fine under the law. And additionally, uh, using AWS recognition to detect if police are present in a photo is also allowed. In order to comply to BIPA, I made a modification to the department model in our database. I added a Boolean field called, is facial recognition allowed? This defaults to false whenever anyone is creating a new department. And on the front end, um, there is an alert displayed when a user submits a photo to a department using facial recognition. Uh, so here's a very brief demo. It just displays the user ex Ooh. Ah, it loaded, excellent. So here, a user selects Springfield. Um, they see an alert because Springfield does use facial recognition, and they can then submit the photo. Golden. OK, let's now transition to talking about the three-pronged technical approach. I'll start with AWS recognition. It's an Amazon tool for machine learning of photos and videos. The detect label feature can identify objects in photos and then return the confidence level associated with that label. And the object could be anything from a police officer to a toy to a fireman. It's interesting to note that there are likely several or many people in this room who may have had recognition used on your photos without recognizing it, without recognizing it. Um, Recognition is actually used by multiple dating apps. So Tinder uses recognition for the Tinder premium feature. And additionally, Coffee Meets Bagel uses recognition to detect any potential nudity. So the next time that you're swiping, 
think about that. Here's an example of the AWS recognition response when I used a photo of Wiggum, a friendly police officer from The Simpsons. You can see that there's an array of labels returned and the associated confidence level. So the label toy has a confidence level of 98.57%, and then the label with the lowest confidence level is police at 59.71%. Recognition by default will only return labels where the confidence level is 55% or greater. However, as a user, you can set a minimum threshold, and additionally, you can set a maximum number of labels you want to have returned. If any of you are interested in trying out recognition, um, you can do a demo through AWS's console. You would have to make an account. Um, here I have a demo with a photo from the NYPD Twitter account which I promised we'd get back to Twitter. So here's the layout, select the photo. And you can see the confidence level associated with different labels. A person is highest, but police is also in there. Nice. This is a code sample from the views file. Um, I wanted to note that we have two separate pages for image upload. So one is only accessible to area coordinators. Uh, they are volunteers that have gone through more vetting and hence have greater privileges in the web app. So they can actually submit directly to officers' individual profiles. This means um, that we don't have to run recognition on it because we can trust the photos to actually have police officers in them. However, if someone is just submitting to the general image submission page, we would run that photo through recognition, and we would also mark that it was sorted by recognition. This is a good way to track what was sorted by humans and what was sorted by computers. And here is the actual method of detect officers. Um, I set the minimum threshold to be 90, so fairly high. I want to note that if a photo is not detected to have police officers, we don't discard it. It goes back into the queue to be hand sorted. As I mentioned, everything is double checked by a human. And at the end, um, on like line 528, you can see that the results and labels are compared to a list of recognition police matches. This includes not only the labels of police and officer, but also military and army. The reason I include these is because when I was first testing recognition, um, I found that photos of police officers in riot gear were frequently detected to be military. I think this is telling. <laughs> Finally, I wanted to note that recognition does include an auto-detect faces feature. Um, I'll run the demo as I explain why I decided not to use this. So I opted to instead use the open source tool Face API JS because I wanted to avoid vendor lock-in and also avoid depending on Amazon for a police oversight project. That being said, um, you know what I mean. That being said, <laughs> Uh, if any of you are familiar with an open source tool that can automatically detect using machine learning if police officers are in a photo, uh, please let me know. I'd love to talk to you afterward. All right, so now we get to face API JS. This is an open source free tool made by Vincent Mueller. Um, his GitHub handle is just a dude who hacks, and I also included a link to the repo on the bottom of the slide. A uh, thing that's really exciting about this tool is it can do both auto detection of faces and actual facial recognition. It is implemented on top of TensorFlow.js. TensorFlow.js is an open source hardware accelerated JavaScript library. You can use it to both train and deploy machine learning models. And it's additionally part of the TensorFlow ecosystem, which, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's an end-to-end -end open source machine learning platform that's used for both developing and training machine learning models. If you'd like to add Face API JS to your project, uh, you have a variety of options for how to do so. It can be used on the back end with Node.js or front end in the browser. As I mentioned before, Open Oversight um, is Python Flask. However, we do have JavaScript on the front end, so I decided to just use it in the browser. And if you're using it in the browser, there's either the option of installing it with NPM and then using a build tool such as Webpack or directly adding the script um, from the repo. I went for the later option. 
Before showing a demo of the face detection in action, um, I'll quickly walk through what's going on underneath the hood. So once the page loads, um, the auto detect faces script will then load all three models needed for face API JS. The models are SSD mobile net v1 model, um, face landmark model, and then also face recognition. You have the option of either storing these models in the project itself or hosting them externally and then making in a, a call to wherever they're hosted. So SSD mobile net v1 is responsible for auto face detection. Um, it draws squares around faces, and it can also return the probability of certainty associated with that result. Next, face landmark um, would just detect the actual face landmarks. That's basically a layman explanation of that is it's the location of different features on your face, like where's your nose? And then lastly, face recognition. Um, so this will compute a face descriptor, which is a feature vector with 128 values that's used to describe a person's face. And by comparing two different face descriptors, you can see if two photos are of the same person. Okay. So after the models are loaded, um, a volunteer can trigger auto face detection by clicking automatically detect a face. And currently, I've only implemented the ability to auto-detect one face per feature. However, Face API JS does include the ability to detect all faces in a photo, um, and that is a goal of mine to soon transition to that, one step at a time. Uh, here's a quick demo with a photo from an officer in the NYPD. You can see that if the user, I'll try to make it full screen. Yeah, so they click auto detect a face and it then draws a square around the officer's face. Okay, but how to implement fa actual facial recognition? This would require you to have a list of the officer's fa names and then also a list of URLs to images. Um, you can probably guess this, but the more photos that you have associated with an officer, and also the higher quality that the photos are, the better results you'll get. When a user clicks the Run Facial Recognition button on the front end, that will trigger Face API um, to call Detect Single Face on all of the available photos, and if no match is found, it'll simply display a message to the user saying there weren't any matches. However, if a match is found, it would display the name of the matching officer. Um, and I again want to stress that the volunteer would still double check this with a roster search form. Um, it's not automatically completed. Got to have humans checking it. OK, so a major question I had when working through this was where to first implement facial recognition. Um, we couldn't do it in Chicago because of the Biometric Information Privacy Act and certain other jurisdictions that we were in, we didn't have photos for a high percentage of the police force. And so this is where we get to the surprise. I have an exciting announcement about a new location that's currently launching on Open Oversight. Burlington, Vermont. I collaborated with members of Burlington Copwatch. I'll give a brief explanation of Copwatch because I don't think it's familiar to everyone. A Copwatch is a community group um, which observes and documents police activity. The objective is to, through presence, prevent any possible instances of police misconduct. Through this work, they've gotten uh, photos and videos of a very high percentage of officers. And I also want to note that because Burlington is a relatively small city, it in turn has a small police force, which is part of how it was easier for them to get photos of a higher percentage of officers. They'll soon be launching their own open oversight instance, and they were kind enough to allow me to use photos to demo facial recognition for you. I wanted to do it with this photo um, because you can actually see the officer's last name is DeFranco. It's apparent on the badge, so you know the result's legit. Uh, let's take a look. So auto detect a face, it draws the square, run facial recognition. Um, I apologize, I don't think you can see in the back, but it says the name of the officer is Brian DeFranco. All right, um, so in review, just to talk about everything we touched on, 
As I said, Open Oversight is a Python Flask web app. Um, the goal is to make it easier to report police misconduct by providing images of officers that are easily searchable like a directory. Um, we got the data through FOIA, scraping social media, and also accepting photos from users. I'm currently working on integrating facial recognition and machine learning in order to process the photos more efficiently. Um, this has raised ethical concerns and also legal concerns. And the surprise was that Burlington, Vermont is getting its own instance of open oversight. So now, the philosophical closing. <laughs> Michel Foucault is a European philosopher who's known for his study of social control, as well as prisons. He discussed the Panopticon, which is a prison model um, that's set up like a circle. You can see an image of it there, where in the center of the circle, there's a watchtower. And then on the outside of the circle, there are cells. The person standing in the watchtower can see everyone in every cell at any time. And if you're in a cell on the outside, you know that you could be being watched, but you never actually know when it's happened. With increased state and police use of surveillance technology, such as stingrays, which can be used to monitor text messages at protests, um, automated license plate readers, which you may have walked by today, or the Detroit Greenlight Initiative, which I discussed earlier in the talk, I fear that we could be living in a panopticon. I want to note that the metaphor is limited. Uh, the different groups in society are going to experience different levels of both police misconduct and surveillance. This depends on factors such as your gender, race, immigration status, and religion. Even though we aren't all experiencing the same level of surveillance, we all have the ability to look toward the center of the panopticon. We have the ability to challenge surveillance, which is being observed from above, with surveillance, being observed from below. So I hope that after this talk, you can all think about ways that you too can help watch the watcher.